Bienvenidos a esta nueva edición de Trading Risk and Beyond. En esta ocasión conversaremos sobre el tema de CBA, FBA, DBA y todos los acrónimos que han surgido a partir de la crisis para la administración del riesgo de contraparte. Contamos con la presencia de John Gregory, autor de unos libros más representativos del tema, y de Alonso Peña, de la Escuela de Negocios SDA Bocconi en Milán, y una de las principales autoridades en el tema en México y Latinoamérica. Mi colega Chris Stanley conversó con ellos sobre estos interesantes temas y qué implican para la administración de riesgos en los tiempos por venir. Acompáñenos. Hello and welcome to another episode of Trading Risk and Beyond. Uh, my name is Chris Stanley and I'm delighted to be joined today by John Gregory, who is a specialist in CVA and credit risk, and Alonso Peña, a quant analyst at Thomson Reuters and Unicredit. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to kick off the conversation. Um, I mentioned there, John, you're an expert in, in CVA. Um, it's been one of these hot topics in recent years. How do you assess um, where we are at the moment uh, when it comes to trying to incorporate the, the cost of risk into, into financial operations? So one of the interesting things with CVA is that, uh, as you might not be surprised to hear, um, if you look at the way banks have reacted around the world, it's moved at very different paces. Uh, now, this is not surprising because um, some of the largest banks have very, very big derivatives books. And so with regard to CVA, which is essentially the credit risk on their derivatives positions, uh, it's more important that they would take a very active approach to, to looking at the CVA. So in general, you could say that uh, a region uh, like this one or, or other emerging regions would, would tend to be rather behind in something like CVA. Uh, and, and you could trace that back to what a large bank had been doing a number of years ago, for example. Having said that, um, this uneven playing field, if you will, um, has been evened up to a large extent recently by two things. One, accounting standards, and two, regulation, mm. which basically means right now that there is a standard for CVA. Most banks would broadly follow that standard. Uh, of course, there are still some exceptions and regions where you might say that it is not market standard, uh, and maybe there's some work needs to be done. But I think one nice thing about CVA is we, we really can say now, for the first time in a long time, that there really is a bit of a market standard. Mm. Alonso, any thoughts? Indeed, I agree with what John was saying. It is very nice, in particular, from the side of regulation to see that the measures used for capital, the capital CVA charge and uh, others, they have a common background across many regions in Asia, in Latin America, in mm. Europe, the United States. And we have a common language. We can discuss very easily with people from different banks from many regions. And this is a very positive step forward in to get an homogeneous idea of how we can incorpor incorporate counterparty credit risk into our day-to-day -day operations. Yeah. You, you both touched on the, on the legislation there. And obviously, there's, there's been a big you know, emergence um, in terms of central counterparty clearinghouses um, in recent years. How, how do you assess? the impact um, of, of, of the implementation of that legislation in terms of, of clearing houses? So uh, the impact is, is still being felt. Uh, I think one thing that's worth mentioning up front is that the traditional problem of CVA is not really solved by uh, clearing a central counterparty. Mm -hmm. and the reason for that is CVA predominantly comes about from uh, having uncollateralized credit exposure to another counterparty. So this basically means uh, a situation where someone, by nature of derivatives, ends up owing you a lot of money. And, and for some reason, they were not able to pledge any collateral, for example, against that. Now, a central counterparty doesn't solve that problem because you have to pledge a lot of collateral to a central counterparty. And so if you have a typical entity like a corporate that does a derivatives transactions, they can't easily centrally clear. So where a central counterparty is, is useful 
is in something like interbank trades, mm -hmm. where essentially they're sitting in the center of a number of banks. And if you imagined a situation where a large bank or financial institution was failing, mm -hmm. they should act as some sort of shock absorber in that situation. Um, having said that, there are a lot of negatives, of, or, or a lot of difficulties at least, with, with the advent of central counterparties more, which is uh, not least of which is, is what's my CVA to a central counterparty. Mm -hmm. And whilst uh, I think we've been muddling along for a while with, with saying, well, the answer to that is it's zero, uh, I think we have to realise now, of course, that it's not zero. And it's a slightly difficult problem because, of course, a central counterparty is unlikely to fail but in the event they do fail, that your exposure to them would be very large. Mm. So from a CVA problem, this is traditionally quite a difficult problem because therefore a number of my CVA to a central counterparty is $1 million is telling me virtually nothing because what it's probably telling me is I have a very small chance to lose a very large amount. So this is not obviously helpful. So they, they have certain benefits for the market, but at the same time they, they introduce certain challenges like how we should look at our risk if we're a bank to a central counterparty. Yeah. Alonso, what, what are your thoughts about how you know, central counterparties, are they enough to, to mitigate CVA risk, in, in your opinion? Um, central counterparties um, uh, worry me a lot ah. because they are a, a way in which we are trying to eliminate the problem of counterparty credit risk by putting everything together, all the eggs in one basket. Mm. And certainly it, it helps a lot in terms of the operations, in terms of the uh, ways and contracts are managed in terms of the collateral and margins and everything, having everything standardized and under one roof, that helps a lot. But if this roof fails, it fails on a lot of people and it creates big problems. And I think this problem, we must be careful and we must address this risk of the central counterparties as well defaulting. I mean, it's an interesting point you make. There's a sense in some, somewhere that these CCP could become in themselves too big to fail. Indeed, absolutely. But how do we define too big to fail? Yeah. You know, are, are we going to save some specific CCP, not another? And who decides that? Yeah. What are your thoughts on that, John? I think a CCP is, is well, at least the, the, the main CCPs are already too big to fail. And I don't think that is, an, is a surprise to the regulators. Uh, I think it was an unfortunate balance that on the one hand, if you looked at the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, the bilateral OTC market functioned extremely badly in the aftermath of that result. There's a complete lack of transparency mm. and real, real chaos in terms of the sheer volume of transactions and, and litigation that arose from not agreeing on the valuation of various pieces. Uh, the central clearing world actually worked quite well in so much as it was already clearing some of the OTC derivatives. So th that led to a natural conclusion that, well, well, this can help. A central counterparty can help us in a Lehman-like default scenario. But on the other hand, there are, there are some criticisms you could make of that logic. And then, unfortunately, as Alonso says, you're putting all your eggs in one basket and then watching very carefully the basket. They are, they are too big to fail. They might be able to fail more elegantly than a bank could fail. Uh -huh. But at the same time, they are too big to fail. Furthermore you can make a loss by being a member of a CCP without the CCP failing. So if you would define a default as losing just $1 of, of your money, then CCPs can actually default quite easily. That, that doesn't mean a default in the traditional sense. It would be a sort of soft default where they would, as a member, they would actually use some of my capital to survive some losses. I would make a loss as a member of that CCP, but, but they wouldn't default per se. So it introduces another complex problem, which is in credit in general, we say someone defaults or not, and if they default, I lose money. If they don't default, I don't lose money. With a central counterparty, it's a bit more subtle. Clearly, they could default and it's going to be chaos, or maybe they, they can't possibly default, as we've already said. But then they could have a, some sort of a mini default where, where they impose some losses on their members. but. Those members uh, have not experienced a real default, but they've still lost money. That's what you mean by elegant failure? Uh, well, an elegant failure is slightly different, which might be that a CCP might not default per se, but might impose losses on their members in a fairly vigorous way, such that they can survive. So if you give one example of that, the classic example would be tear-up, where a CCP might have at its disposal 
the ability to actually cancel contracts. So that means that if I've maybe been a member of the CCP and I've defaulted and Alonso has some contracts with the CCP, they may not have been con contracts that Alonso had with me. They, they're, they're contracts Alonso has with the CCP. But the CCP says the way in which we're managing John's default is we're going to cancel the contracts we have with you. That's now, very nice, yes. <laughs> Alonso is not going to be very happy about that, I, I'm guessing. But, but, but this is one of the, maybe, uh, is that elegant? Uh, well, maybe it's, it's better than the alternative. Yeah, yeah. But it is some sort of inelegant, uh, some sort of way in which the CCP imposes losses trying to reduce systemic risk. Honestly, th any thoughts on that model? That <laughs> well, uh, I, have, I, have, I, have, <clears throat> I have my worries about the elegant uh, part of it, but no, I agree with John. It's much better a soft landing than sort of just a crash. Yeah. Financial markets don't like that. And uh, the ability of central uh, counterparties to manage this might be a positive way, a positive way to manage these sort of big spikes we mm. have in, in defaults or as we say now, losses that are not real complete defaults in the central counterparty. So indeed, I think that's as a, a security block extra that helps. It's, it's an unfortunate consequence that if you work within financial markets and indeed if you work within pretty much any profession, uh, and so even if you're a regulator within financial markets, if you have the option of a scenario where you've effectively put all of the probability well into the tail, so basically, you said, rather than having problems every few years, we will have a major crisis every 20 to 30 years. Then actually, for most people, this is a good thing to do, because it means you will have a very nice, relaxed career. You'll do a good job, according to everyone who is judging you. And then there will be an enormous failure. But by then, you may be out of the market. You may have retired or so on. And, and I think for people who are worried about CCPs, this might be the sort of worry they have, that Maybe they prevent some small crises, but they give you this uh, possibility of having yet another major crisis mm. where a CCP is failing. Mm. And that's very unlikely, but if and when it does happen, it will probably make Lehman Brothers bankruptcy look like a bit of a picnic. That's fairly terrifying. Indeed, the, <laughs> the whole interconnectedness of the financial, modern financial system make this uh, hole created by the fail of one CCP connected to everything, you know, a systemic problem for everyone. That could be really, really scary indeed. Do you see any alternative then? Is this the best we've got at the moment? The best we got at the moment? Well, yes and no. Yes, because it, it's, uh, as John was saying, historically has shown that, you know, it's a good idea and it has helped during actual problems happening. Um, no, because I think that we, in any case, we have to be careful and not close our eyes. Because one risk that we could say is, oh, I'm dealing with the CCP, no problems. Yeah. All, all counterparty credit risk is sorted. But in fact, there is always a risk. And we should always have staff. We, we should always incorporate this risk in the operations or portfolio that we're doing. And then manage this always. And not just uh, forget about it. Yeah. So this is also a risk that we should keep in mind. Alonso mentioned it there. Uh, yet another acronym, the, uh, the XVA is sort of emerging these days. A number of banks seem to have, or are incorporating XVA desks. Um, can you tell us a little bit about you know, what are they? How do they function? What do they do? Well, so XVA just means uh, everything that is VA. So to prevent ourselves having to, uh, to list them, and, and just in case uh, we, we invent another one, we'll just call it XVA. So uh, it just means, it means everything. Um, Alonso, it's, it's, a, it's a, compl a compl point I completely agree with. Um, we, we go through paradigm shifts in derivatives markets, and, and I guess in any markets, that, for example, in 1987, the stock market crash, before this time, we didn't really understand so well volatility smile. But it wasn't that then it came and then it went away again. We, we, we lived with it ever since. Mm. In the last crisis, I think we will look back and decide that was the time we really uh, fully discovered CVA, or regulators did at least, and, and then the market fully appreciated the importance of funding, FVA, capital, KVA. So, as Alonso says, CVA is the most important, not, most, not because CVA is necessarily the biggest, but you have to remember that CVA is the predominant part of capital as well. So when we talk about KVA, we're really talking about the capital of, mm. of CVA. 
But I don't think anything will go away. I think they're all to, there to stay. But there will be different market conditions, and there are different banks. There will be times when funding is cheap and capital is cheaper. There will be banks that have easier access to capital and banks that have less easy access to capital. So it is a paradigm shift, and, and now we generically say you need to consider XVA. None of them will go away. There might be new ones, uh, and hence we leave it open-ended. How widespread is the adoption of XVA desks at the moment in the banking world? Well, I think the, the CVA desk is, is, is almost a market standard amongst at least the large banks. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a question of how much more of the XVA do you push in their direction. So I would say in the largest banks, the XVA desk is more of a market standard in that they look at CVA, they certainly look at FVA, and they possibly look at some other aspects on capital and collateral. In a more medium-sized, smaller bank, they're mostly focusing on CVA. And of course, in a, in a very small bank, they may have no desk at all, but they may be considering having some sort of CVA desk. So it's like the first point I meant, there's a bit of a progression. I start with nothing, then I have to have a CVA desk, uh, and then eventually it becomes an XVA desk and does more and more. It doesn't mean that you have to have one desk, which is doing everything. It doesn't mean there is one model that everyone has to follow, but that's, that's broadly speaking, the way of things. And also, one other thing we might mention is that for the first time in recent regulation, regulators have, have basically said that you must have a CVA desk, or at least more specifically, they've said if you want to qualify for low capital charges, you must have a CVA desk. And so that's the first time that's actually happened. It seems to be you know, an issue here. You know, we, we, we're layering complexity on complexity, or arguably. Um, is there a, a risk? <laughs> That, that traders aren't able to sort of cope with, understand all these different risk measurements that we're putting in place, Alonso? Well, traders, they do what they want. So, you know, certainly we have a lot of more complexities, as you say now, there are more risks, but there's always the counterbalancing act that there is the real market there and that you have to buy, you have to sell something in the, very, in the end, mm. beyond mathematical models, beyond the risks and everything that you have. So. Yes, uh, um, we should be aware, and I hope that front desks are more and more aware of all those risks. And uh, well, the aim, the, my wish is that there's more integration, that uh, there's more uh, awareness of these different type of risks when some deals are done or not. Mm. Um, so yes, it is more complex, but uh, as John was saying, it's a, it's a brave new world. Yeah. It's, we live in, in this new world, we should get used to this. And uh, we cannot anymore do a cowboy <laughs> act yeah. in buying or selling things with our eyes closed. We can't anymore. Are you seeing this getting sort of more integrated, sort of front of house? Unfortunately, there's a, the far, as fast as I can manage to integrate and tackle these problems, as you say, complexity is increasing all the time, and I, I can't keep up with it. And it seems that it's. It must be quite difficult somehow for financial markets and regulation of, of financial markets to avoid mm. this problem that things naturally become more complicated. And I'll give you one example. So from September this year, the, the largest banks will be subject to some bilateral margin requirements, which, which loosely speaking means that two large banks trading with each other will have to post each other additional collateral, which is called initial margin. That's a fairly simple regulation at, at, at first glance, which is basically to reduce CVA. So if I have CVA, I'm a bank and I have CVA to Alonso, and he's another bank and he has CVA to me. Now we're going to post each other initial margin to reduce that CVA. So it seems like a perfectly normal regulatory reaction to some of the problems. But here are some of the issues of that. First of all, Alonso and I have to agree how much initial margin we're going to post to each other. Very difficult. Very difficult. Secondly, Alonso and I have to include the effect of the initial margin within our CVA calculation. Hopefully, that will tell us it's quite small. Unfortunately, the initial margin is dynamic, meaning it changes every day. So when we put it into our CVA calculation, we have to recognize the fact that it changes every day. We also have to see how much capital relief we'll get from that. The current capital rules don't really recognize initial margin. So now we have to invent new capital rules that do recognize initial margin. So you see from, that's not the full picture, I could go on and on and on. You see from a, a relatively simple initiative that seems to make perfect sense, suddenly everything becomes more complicated. So unfortunately, I think uh, it's good for a lot of people who work within derivatives markets, quants and so on. 
Unfortunately, it seems very difficult to actually reduce complexity. Even when regulators come in and try and reduce complexity, and, and they have reduced complexity in some sense because a lot of the more complex products that obviously gave us this complexity have essentially been either pretty much banned or, or, or disincentivized too much. Mm. But then all the complexity is on the really simple things. So th the financial markets have not got simpler. The derivatives world has, has got more complicated. And unfortunately, regulation has been doing that. But I don't think that's the des by design. That's mm. not the intention. It's the unintended consequence. Any, any, anything to add on so? Absolutely. No, it's a very complex world. It's yeah. a very complex world, and it's not getting simpler. You know, and it's difficult to navigate, certainly. Well, I think that's a, an interesting, yeah, a, a good note to, to finish on. Just before we do finish, I know you've both been participating at the, the risk management and, and training conference uh, here in Mexico City. Just give us um, your, your feedback, your thoughts about, about, about your experience at the event this year. Well, it has been a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's my second year, and uh, I have been doing courses all days with many participants and a lot of very enthusiastic uh, uh, participants from many walks of uh, life in the financial mm -hmm. markets. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be in Mexico, to be in such a high level conference and to discuss with people, discuss things which show you that you could be anywhere in the world. You know, this conference could be anywhere. And uh, that is a great feeling. John, I know this isn't your first time here. It's my third year, yeah. so I uh, <laughs> wouldn't come back for more if, if I didn't think it was great. I think. Uh, the location is excellent, the organization is excellent, and as Alonso says, uh, uh, it's a very large conference, there are a lot of delegates, um, but everyone is very, very keen to learn. We've had some incredible speakers, uh, I think high profile speakers that you don't expect to see at normal conferences. So it's been altogether a fantastic event. Yeah. And when you look at sort of the, the, you know, the, the financial environment here in, in, in Mexico and people working in this, in this sector, how important is this sort of training which, which Rismatics offers uh, for people working in this environment in Mexico and Latin America? It's crucial. It's crucial because indeed markets are complex. The sophistication of users is growing all the time and regulation is running behind, as we were mm -hmm. saying. So the, uh, we have to keep up with it. So there is no chance anymore of just staying in your niche and learning by doing things. We cannot do that anymore. Yeah. So financial education now is more important than ever. Yeah, and I would just add that I think looking at, again, the regulations that are happening and the way that impacts the derivatives balance sheets and the balance sheets in general of large US banks, large European banks, they have to shrink. Uh, they're unlikely to, to grow. Uh, and that provides an opportunity and, in fact, provides a need for other regions to, to expand. Mm. So actually, whilst I think uh, in, in some of the major regions uh, we're probably not anticipating that there's a huge amount of market growth, people still need to be sophisticated and stay ahead of what's going on. But in fact, in a region like uh, this one, uh, in Mexico, then we're thinking about a situation where actually there's going to be potentially growth as well. So even more important to be innovating and staying ahead of what's going on. That's great. John Gregory, Alonso Peña, thank you very thank much you. to both of you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for taking the time to, to be with us today and look forward to welcoming you again on the next edition of Trading Risk and Beyond. Audio Jungle. Audio Jungle.